What a privilege to be here together at a place like this, at a time like this. Let us pray. Dear God, as we consider the Sabbath theme, may we not forget about you, Lord, our Savior, that we consider you the center because you are so, and that as we study about justice and what we learn of the Sabbath in this topic, May we always keep you in the center. This is what we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You see, my wife had to go to Dominican Republic for a very sad engagement to say goodbyes to her father. And I was sad not to be able to go as well as sad for the fact that he was dying. It doesn't get sadder than that in this world. But there was a time of joy, rejoicing, when she returned. I decided to prepare. <laughs> so I went to Kinkos, and my creative self prepared a six feet long banner. <laughs> then I had one placed on the door. And I went to the store, I think it was TG Maxx. And I, buy, I bought some nine gowns. And to be really, really clever, I went to a secret store that I have not revealed to my wife who is here, so I will not say it now. And I bought a rock stone with the words, my love for you is engraved in stone. And I felt so clever. <laughs> to top it off, I took a broomstick and I did another sign and brought it to the airport and was lifting it up. <laughs> the Sabbath is like all those preparations I refer to you. It's the placeholder. And it's a placeholder that comes once a week for 24 hours. And you and I are expected to be there. <laughs> but what would have happened if I had put all my interest in the preparation. And then, the time when she was arriving at LAX, I would have been wrapping the box and unwrapping it and wrapping it again and looking at the rock and thinking of my cleverness. This would have been total failure. Today, we will be talking very briefly about Sabbath keeping and justice. But we need to keep in mind the only reason for any of this to make any sense, the only rationale for any of this to be put forward, the only justification to bring it up in this assembly and this house of the Lord is because Jesus is Lord. So I begin reading a text that I read it from paper. And if you want to read it, look for paper. Acts chapter 4 Verses 11 and 12. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Amen. <laughs> so as we talk about Pax Romana and the other historical events, we need to keep in mind the reason, the cornerstone. You see, Pax Romana, in the Occlesian times, when he was the emperor, the year is 302, and the author that we are quoting, Lehart, describing the relationship between Pax Romana and the events that I am about to explain to you took place, says Pax Romana 
was the Euclidean firmly believe the product of pas deorum, the peace of the gods. Have you noticed how this is an inclination of all leaders and all empires and all nations to call on God as justification to what they do? So we see ourselves as representative and our motives are supposedly to follow God. Of course, for the Pax Romana, it was many gods. And what they did, the sacrifices, they took place at the central square. And there had all kinds of festivals. And Romanus, who was a deacon and an exorcist, decided he was to respond to the Pax Romana. He was to fix it. Something is wrong, we have to fix it. We have to eliminate the sacrifices that are so, such an insult to the only true God. So Romanus went early morning to the central square. And there he was, the Euclidean and the whole crowd, ready to have the next sacrifice in this ceremony, because in their mindset, if the gods were happy, the economy would be good. The borders will be safe. And Wall Street will do good. If we are in relationship, positive relationship with the gods, they will bless us. And how do we get positive relationship with the gods? We do sacrifices. And Romanus, being part of that culture, could not help it. He gave also a sacrifice. There's no way he would not have known what would have happened to him as a result, as a direct result of what he did. Because what he did was similar to having a deacon of our church. Any deacons around? A deacon of our church, local church, go to Washington, or go better, to New York, to Wall Street. And just before the president of the nation who has been invited to ring the bell that day, to the start of the session of trading, he will jump, intending to grab the hand of the president and prevent the ringing of the bell. What do you think would have happened to this deacon, if we would have, if he would have attempted such a thing, it would have been clear in the mind of the deacon. I don't think a deaconess would have tried that. <laughs> it would have been clear in the mind of the deacon that the rest of his life will be in prison. And it was clear in the mind of Romanos, I presume and I propose, that he was also pursuing the same logic as the Romans had. Pax Romana. Do a sacrifice so that you can provoke God to bring about justice and to bring about his reign. And so, the Ecclesians' first order was to cut off his tongue to prevent further insults to the Pax Romana, to the gods, and to the Roman Empire and the office of the emperor. A year after, his head was cut off. The question we have before us, how is our Pax Americana? How are we interpreting it? You see, Pax Americana is based on a constitutional document. We have a constitutional government. And this document promotes Happiness. But notice, happiness is not the same as rest. It's not the same as Shabbat Shalom. The happiness promoted here is one that the government can handle. If the government could handle true peace and happiness, we will have no need for psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, pastoral counseling, 
and all of the other mental health providers. True shalom only comes not through the Pax Americana and the American dream. It's not about just fixing what is wrong with America, if anybody thinks that there's anything wrong. I mean, I am Puerto Rican. <laughs> what do I know? If I was living in Puerto Rico, along with other four million American pseudo-citizens, I could not vote for the president. So what do I know? Don't take my opinion. What do I know and what do American Samoans know? There are 500,000 of them and they are not even full citizens. They are American nationals. So what do we islanders know? Don't take it from me. That's why I quote the Constitution. So you can read it. So you can have the words of authority. Well, how shall evangelicals relate to this Pax Romana? It has to do with the Sabbath, you will see. You see, we evangelicals have to decide. Where do we belong? John 15, 19, and I read, If you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Romanos wanted to be love. So he wanted to change the system. By the way, Romanos did not protest the fact that at that very year and at that very time and through a long period, the bishops of the church had been persecuting other Christians because they believe other beliefs than them. You see, Romanos, you and I and all have a choice. Do I believe that dogma and doctrine has to do with propositions that are fixed, that need not be tinkered with in any shape or form? Or do we believe in truth as a man named Jesus who comes to live with us and inhabit the flesh? And he so much loved the flesh that he had to eat a fish on his way to heaven. <laughs> and some honey. Twice, according to the record. Are you students of the Bible? You see, he so much loved the flesh because the flesh has something to do with the reality of God. I mean, remind me, are we not likeness and image of the Most High? And what are we? Oh, well, what are we? I'm not going to get into that subject. Read Joel Green. <laughs> Read Nancy Murphy. Not Johnny the Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Who are we? One thing we are among whatever and however we all define each other, an amen for diversity. Shall we say amen? amen. Are you alive? Amen. The Lord created flesh and breath into it. So we need evangelicals to understand that we are not of this world. Our flesh, though it's flesh like the flesh of everybody else, it's not of this world. We have a different origin. We have been called out of the world. John 17, 15 gives us the clear instructions. There's a lot of confusion here. Some may hear me say, let's give our backs to the world. Let's forget about the world and let's get into the real thing. Let's become monks or some kind of people who go into a cave. And believe me, not only Catholics have caves, Seventh-day Adventists have caves also. And all of us have caves. And some of our preachers come from caves. And they seem to have remained in the cave. 
And we may even invite them to go back to the cave. You see, the Lord has called us to engage. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. It's all about relationships. With whom are we engaged in our fight for justice? What is the rationale we have without Jesus at the center, with our relationship with God, we will become allies of the enemy. I am not one who will judge Romanus. I already said I love diversity. I am glad the judgment is in God's hands. If it was on my hands, I would not allow myself in. So I praise God for being in charge. Romanus, with his action, made a change. Oh yes, we can make change. All kinds of changes. He was not expecting the change he promoted. You see, the Occlesian, the or the Occlesiano, to be more comfortable and closer to the Latin origin. The Ecclesiano had been lobby. There were lobbies in those days also. Had been lobby to sign a decree of persecution, annihilation, and an elimination of Christians and a few other groups that were a pest, particularly because they were fighting the Pax Romana. And the emperor had been holding back, either because he was good or the Holy Spirit and the angels were struggling with him, or I have no idea, I cannot explain, but the actions of Romanus tipped the balance. And he signed the decree, the first one of several, for persecution, annihilation, taking away property, taking away the rights. You see, if he had been Puerto Ricans, he would have been closer to uh, taking care of that because if you live in Puerto Rico, you cannot vote. If you are, oh, did I tell you already about the American Samoans? <laughs> they are not even citizens. They are nationals. And we are all happy with that. I mean, they are islanders from some Pacific island that we conquered. Oh, no, 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 no. We visited to help them. <laughs> so... We have been called to engage the world. But in what manner? Exodus 20, the commandment at the heart of the Ten Commandments, tells us how. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Lord knew we will forget. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. <laughs> I love the list. <laughs> Particularly, I love the fact that within the patriarchal Old Testament system, one section, one institution, one member was left out. Have you noticed? Wives, they are not commanded to stop all work. Wives, there are two interpretations for this. And I will not give you the footnotes because they don't hold well on the air. The first interpretation is that women were not commanded to rest. The wives, I mean, because the daughters are. But as soon as you become a wife, you're not part of the commandment. The wives are not meant to rest in order to fight against extreme ideas of keeping the Sabbath holy. Remember the signs I was talking about? Well, there are some folk in all religions that have something to do with Sabbath keeping, however you conceive it, that dedicate their energy to come up with laws of how to keep it holy. Woo! When I went to college, they had laws. Oh, yes. About bath, about in and out, about what to speak, about what to see. And the list goes on and on. The Lord brought me out from a spiritism 
I was set to be the next medium in my family. But he called me out to be his medium within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's the Lord's choice. And I am here with you today to tell you about the Sabbath. Women are left out, the second line of reasoning goes, because they never get tired. And in this fact, wives never get tired, even having more power than God. Because God, after six days of creation, was exhausted <laughs> and had to rest. But women, they, as, be, as soon as they become wives, are endowed with a power that they need no rest, even better than God. But I could give you the footnote. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 27, 28. The Lord calls us to remember why we keep it holy. Why we set aside one day in seven. Then, the, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord. He is the creator and redeeming God. The beauty of this idea of a God that has to rest and invites us to rest with him has been presented by Brueggemann in a beautiful way. Let's read from his book, Sabbath as Rebellion, what this may mean. This performance and exhibit of divine rest does characterize the God of creation. Creation itself and the creatures made in the image of the resting God. Creation is to be enacted and embraced without defining anxiety. Indeed, such divine rest serves to delegitimize and dismantle the endless restlessness sanctioned by the other gods and enacted by their adherents. Let's swallow this piece by piece. Brueggemann is suggesting that the fact that God had to rest after six days of hard labor creating this world and that's why we have the seven-day cycle, comes because God stops to smell the roses. That's a Puerto Rican translation. <laughs> this smelling of roses has to do with a party. And in this party, every week, the Lord of the Sabbath ought to be the center. Don't stay home making preparations or even go to church concentrating only on the preparations. Enjoy the Lord of the Sabbath for 24 hours. Yes, 24 hours is the commandment. The Lord tells us, Brueggemann, that divine rest on the seventh day, moreover, is recalled in the commandments of Exodus 31, 12 to 17, wherein God is refreshed on the seventh day. What a beautiful idea. What a delightful en uh, encounter. Let's go to the rationale for keeping the Sabbath holy. And what does that mean according to Exodus 20? Sabbath has to do not only with rest, it has to do with ecology, with family, with neighbor, all included. Yes, Freddie Gray is included. Freddie Gray's memory is included. Romanus' memory is included. And are particularly included all those that are within your immediate circle. It's so easy to get caught up 
on the injustices outside of home that we forget the people we sleep and we share a bed with. Justice ought to begin home. And that the Sabbath reminds us of. But it does not stay there. Because you see, you cannot keep the fourth commandment in a cave. As much as people may try, you need a donkey or a mule. An ox, no wives are needed because they are not called to rest. You need a son and a daughter. But of course, we're talking about ecology, human relations. Being single is A-OK. -okay. And you can keep the Sabbath as long as you are in relationships. The Lord has called us to remember this fact. One of every seven days. Deuteronomy 5 verses 12 to 15 give us the second rationale for keeping the Sabbath holy. Those are like Romanus that believe only one doctrine, only one understanding, only one reading, only one creed, have a hard time with the fourth commandment. Because, remind me, wasn't it the finger of God who wrote it according to Exodus 20? Was it the finger of God? Was it the finger of God who wrote it? Okay. How come then Deuteronomy 5 has a second version? What happened? What kind of ink got used? Was it a www website that changed every day? How can you handle this? Doctrinarians who want only one understanding? Contextualization is the word to use. We have been reminded, and let's read it, that there is more than one reason to keep the Sabbath holy. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox, your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as you, as well as you. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out From there, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath holy. So why shall we keep the Sabbath holy? Because God has redeemed us with an outstretched mighty arm. Praise to his name. Praise to the Lord who took me out from the mouth of Satan from talking with demons in the face of ancient ancestors of ours. Praise the Lord who brought me out to salvation in Jesus and taught me the Bible and the ways of the Lord. And he has done that with you. Would you say amen? amen. And we all have it in a different way with a different story. Shall you say amen? amen. Yes contextual ways that the Lord has used, all diverse, but all united in one Lord and all commanded to keep weekly Sabbath holy for 24 hours in order to promote justice. Why? Because God is creator and God is redeemer. Why keep it? There are two rationales. Creator, liberator, redeemer. Therefore, we fight for justice. For the Christian oikos. I have to throw, throw some Greek, you see. I mean, my education has not been in vain. My Greek professor will be happy. 
Oikos household has the connotation of family and economy. Tying together the economic gain, the dollar sign, with what we do with each other. Because the Lord commands us to be together in the company of believers once a week and spend 24 hours, not necessarily together, but with him full time. And this reminds us of the irreducible, inscrutable, and relational nature of God's demands on Christians and the world. An ecological community with a Christian oikos that creation-driven Sabbath rest demands of Christianity. Oikos being the Greek word for the household, a word that is in the Greek New Testament time, including both ecology and economy. And there I quote myself. <laughs> now, I had to. We will go to Weber 2002 as we think with the last 44 seconds I have of what shall we do. In the book entitled The Younger Evangelicals Facing the Challenge of the New World, Weber reminds us, because the younger evangelical is turning away from theology as ruled by reason and scientific method toward theology as a reflection of the community on the narrative of Israel and Jesus, new questions are emerging as central. Are we ready for change? Are we ready to see ways that are not based on gods that do not rest? Are we ready to see ways that demand for God to rest with us because he choose to do so? Are we ready to see that engaging justice may not look the way that Romanos painted it? Are we ready to listen to the new generation of which I am not a part of? I am already 58, but I have been reading about them. I have even lived with some of them. Three sons of ours. May the Lord help us. Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you.